Just about a week ago, I risked serious injury, to my ego at least, to show you how to BIOS flash your RX 480 into an RX 580 and what the gains could be from doing so. While the results weren't too exciting, higher core and memory clock speeds, and most importantly, a nice little FPS boost in your favorite games, it's something that I consider worthwhile. So worthwhile that I decided to do the same with my RX Vega 56. Yep, that's right. We're about to see how much extra performance we can squeeze out of the Vega 56 by slapping it repeatedly until it starts believing that it's a Vega 64. And while we're at it, we're also going to be crossfiring the 64 imposter with an actual 64, because why the heck not? If you've done any research at all into BIOS flashing your AMD GPU, you know that it can be a risky endeavor. It will almost always void your warranty and you can end up breaking your card entirely. So if you don't completely understand, and accept the risks involved, you might want to take a hard pass on this one. Okay, with that out of the way, and with only the bravest, most adventurous left among you, let's get right into it. BIOS flashing AMD's RX Vega is a very similar procedure to flashing the RX 400 and 500 series cards. In fact, it's actually a little safer and easier since the RX Vega cards have a nifty little BIOS switch by default that allows you to, you know, switch to another BIOS in case something goes wrong. Which, by the way, don't ever write over both BIOSes. Only do one, because if you write over both and screw it up, brick. Now first you need to download two programs available for free from Tech Power Up, including GPU-Z and the ATI Flash utility. For the first, most important step, you'll need to save a copy of your Vega 56's original BIOS, which I totally forgot to do while preparing for this, but nobody needs to know that. To save your BIOS, all you need to do is open up GPU-Z and look for the Save BIOS button. From there, click on the Save to File and click a location to save the BIOS where you'll be able to find it easily. While we won't be modifying this original BIOS, it's always best to keep it safe if you need to flash your card back to its original state and in case you accidentally flash both BIOSes on the card. Next, you'll have to do some light digging to find an appropriate Vega 64 BIOS. Obviously, if you have a Vega 64 on hand like I did, you could just use its BIOS, but I doubt that will be the case for the majority of you. In order to find an appropriate BIOS file, all you need to do is head to Tech Power Up's handy video BIOS collection, enter the details of the Vega 64 BIOS that you'd like to flash onto your 56, and then download it. While most of the Vega 64 BIOS files in the collection are seemingly identical, a good rule of thumb is to stick with the same manufacturer of the card you'll be flashing the BIOS onto. Oh, and if you have an air cool card, do not, I repeat, do not try to flash the BIOS of a liquid cooled card onto it. There's a high probability that if successful, your air cooled card won't be able to sufficiently keep the heat produced by the higher clock speeds and voltages in check. In my case, since I already have a reference AMD air cooled Vega 56, I downloaded the reference air cooled Vega 64 BIOS. The next and last step is the scariest part, actually flashing your card's BIOS. To do that, we'll be using the ATI flash utility. After starting the utility as administrator, you should see a menu where you can select the card you want to flash. After selecting it, head down and click on load image. You should be, then be able to navigate to and select the Vega 64 BIOS that you downloaded earlier. After that, it's as simple as hitting the program button. After that process finishes, your system should reboot and you should have yourself a brand spanking new Vega 64. I mean, sort of. It's not like the BIOS flash will magically add or unlock more compute units, stream processors, or texture units to match the 64. But what it does do is give you a really decent memory and core clock boost and unlock some voltages, which is almost as good. But just how good? Well, to find out, I benchmarked the card running its icky stock BIOS, and then again after the flash. I also threw my real Vega 64 into the mix to see if the Flash 56 comes even close to the same level of performance. All benchmarks run were done at 1440p, the highest possible quality presets, low anti-aliasing, and DX12 where possible, so let's see what the numbers have to say. Well, it turns out they have quite a lot to say, and most importantly, they show that flashing the 56 into a 64 definitely results in higher frame rates in all but one of the games I tested. I'm looking at you, silly Hitman benchmarks. Unfortunately, it's not as big of an improvement as I'd have liked to see. Similar to when I flashed the RX 480 into a 580, the pure FPS gains were minimal at best. Most of the benchmarks I ran show that the Flash 56 winning over its non-flash self by only 1 to 3 FPS with only Total War Warhammer 2 seeing a significant improvement of about 5 FPS. Another thing that becomes abundantly clear is that neither the regular nor Flash 56 had any real hope of matching the performance of a purebred Vega 64. I guess the card's extra compute units and all that other good stuff counts for something after all. Seriously though, I was never expecting a Flash 56 to perform as well as the real thing. But I can't say I wasn't surprised at just how close it came in quite a few games. While I didn't overclock the cards for the benchmarks, I can't imagine that given the right chip, overclock Vega 56 could conceivably match a 64 running at stock. Which is impressive, no matter how you slice it. Speaking of Crossfire, wait, was I talking about Crossfire? It doesn't matter. It's actually called Crossfire X because new AMD reasons, and I'm talking about it right now. Perfect transition, yes. Anyways, yes. 
AMD's Crossfire is a thing that exists, and since it exists, there's no way I was going to pass up the opportunity to use it with my two Vega cards. I did originally intended only running my Vega 56 Plus 8 and Vega 64 Crossfire to see whether it would work and to see what the scores would be like. But there was no reason to not go ahead and see what a regular 56 and 64 running in Crossfire configurations could do, so that's what I decided to test first. Unsurprisingly, my Vega 64 had no trouble downclocking itself to match the 56, and Crossfire worked like a dream. And by that, I mean it didn't crash every benchmark I ran instantly. It took a fair bit of tweaking, including switching Ashes of the Singularity and Deus Ex to DX11 to ensure that Crossfire was indeed working correctly, but I eventually got some good data. Or maybe good isn't the right word here. Interesting is a far better way to describe the results that I got. Well, most of the games I tested saw a really hefty frame rate increases across the board and a pretty exceptional score and increase in 3D Mark's time spy, titles like Hitman and Middle Earth Shadow of War experienced the opposite. Both of those games not only performed worse than expected, but performed worse than either of the cards working alone. Mixed results to say the least, and why I don't recommend Crossfire. But hey, these are two very different cards trying to work together as a team, so it's hardly all that shocking, right? Maybe, after we remove some of these differences by teaming up the 64 with an almost 64, surely that'll make things a little bit better. Oh no, it's so much worse! Right off the bat, this weird Frankenstein's monster of a configuration proved inferior to just cross-firing both cards at stock. Ashes of the Singularity scored a little lower than it did before, and Deus Ex Mankind Divided absolutely refused to run no matter what I tried. And just when I thought it couldn't get much worse, Hitman and Rise of the Tomb Raider scores dropped by 20 and 27 FPS respectively. After that, Total War Warhammer 2, Time Spy, and Shadow of War redeemed the config a little by scoring ever so slightly higher than before, but then it takes a dive again, scoring worse in Ghost Recon Wildlands than all of the other scores. Now, I entirely understand that these strange benchmark scores could be caused by various issues and bugs with the games themselves, my test system, or just trying to get a higher and lower tier graphics card to work together. But this isn't my first rodeo, and I believe it's more of a testament to show just how stupid Crossfire, and by association SLI, is for the average gamer. That's not to say I don't see the value in multi-GPU setups. In certain applications and games that support them, Crossfire and SLI could easily dominate in terms of performance. However, that's a pretty short list of games right now, and I can't see all that many developers feeling in an urgent need to expand it. But that's not even the main problem here. No matter how good your multi-GPU config is, it's almost always more practical and economical to just upgrade to a single GPU setup, especially with GPU prices just barely out of the toilet. Two Vega 56 cards right now will cost you about $230 more than a GTX 1080 Ti. And what do you get for that extra dough? Inferior, unstable performance, higher power consumption, and a pat on the back for being an idiot. Unless you plan to mine with those cards when you're not gaming, it's probably not a pretty good investment. And before some of you get all huffy and think that I'm singling out AMD, the same holds true for NVIDIA's cards. Two 1070 Ti's or 1080's might net you around the same performance as a 1080 Ti, but it'll cost a fair bit more and is still astronomically stupid because of all of the bugs. Dual card solutions in general are always worse for the money, and if a faster single card solution exists on the market, you should definitely pick it up. And I know that the results of this flash were a little bit underwhelming, just like they were with the RX 480 flash that we did a couple of weeks ago, but I still enjoy doing these types of videos. Unfortunately, unlike with the Polaris cards, there's no direct modding of the BIOS that's allowed right now for Vega. So we can't really get better than just adjusting things in Wattman, whereas with the 400 and 500 series cards, you could adjust frequency limits, memory timings, and so much more. But at least with the flash from Vega 56 to 64, you can get 1100 MHz on the memory instead of the 56s being barely able to cross 990. Anyways, we'll wrap it up there. What did you think of the flashing of the Vega 56? Do you enjoy these types of experimental videos? Would you run this terrible crossfire setup? Let me know your thoughts either down in the comments or over on Twitter. I'm at UF Disciple. And I know that this video was about Vega, but if you haven't heard already, WooWare and I are partnering up to give away this Zotac GTX 1070 Ti Amp Extreme to celebrate us hitting 40,000 subscribers at the UFD Tech channel. Giveaway is open worldwide, void where prohibited, of course. If you're interested in entering, head on down to the link in the video description to enter for your chance to win. Giveaway entries close on December 15th, so you have plenty of time to get it. Also, while you're down there, you can consider using our Amazon affiliate code for picking up Vega or whatever else you need for your gaming or mining rig. It won't cost you an extra cent, but it does give us a small kickback that helps us out tremendously. 
Be sure to smash that like button if you enjoyed this stupid experiment with the Vega 56 Plus 8. Subscribe to stay up to date on all of our tech-related content. And big thanks to our patrons for helping fund our videos even when they get hit with a demonetization bug. And if you want to join our Patreon where you get behind-the-scenes access plus a ton of other perks, you can hit up patreon.com forward slash UFD tech or click that button right in the top left right corner on your side. It's reversed. Anyways, I'm Brett with the UFD tech channel. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video. Cheers.